So contemporary art, neoliberal reinforcer. What I'm going to do in this talk is basically uh, look at, uh, I'm try, try and explain some of the key features of neoliberalism. Um, it's, a, it's a common term used now for what capitalism is today. Uh, but I think it's not often understood, especially in our field, exactly what neoliberalism entails, specifically contrasted to earlier forms of capitalism. So I'll sketch some of that out. I'll do it by looking at um, global economy. Um, and then I'm going to go on to look at the contemporary art economy, specifically, via gallery and auction uh, structures and uh, economies. Then, we, then I'm going to look at reputation structures in the art field, how reputation is constructed, uh, who gets it, and how it's maintained. Again, that's going to be done mainly through uh, uh, kind of network analysis rather than narrative. And then finally, I'm going to look at the economy of artists. Uh, and through that combination of things, I'm going to try and sort of show that the, the key point is that the uh, art economy is, uh, is a paradigm for neoliberalism, okay? both in its economic structures and also in its politics and in its social structures. And through that, we'll get a clearer sense of what neoliberalism, in fact, means economically and politically. Um, but also maybe how, what sort of maneuvers can be made around it or through it or against it. Um, and I think this talk will make you sad. And it'll make you sad for two reasons. The first reason is it's mainly through charts and graphs. So if you're not familiar with or comfortable with using charts and graphs, it's going to be quite tricky. Uh, but I'll try and explain them as I go along. There's going to be a lot of them. Uh, I've got 101 slides. So... Um, it's going to be fairly, fairly dense. I'm going to try and go quite fast, uh, so they may not, you may not catch all the details, but um, too bad. Um, and the second reason I'll make you sad is because it's sad. Right? Um, it's basically a description of the economic limitations of the art field, but also the extreme segregation of wealth in the art field which affects artists, 90% uh, 90, 90 of artists, very, very badly indeed. And of course, this is your future careers as artists. So I'm going to try and describe what that is, that it's not just a personal issue, it's a kind of structural feature of, of the art field, especially in Britain. But I think Britain is typical uh, of many other places in this regard. Um, and then, uh, uh, and, but I will try and suggest that the kind, the kind of kind of the kind of politics that can be constructed around it, uh, which might address some of the issues. Let me just set my uh, screen so I'm not blanking out. All right, so economic inequality. This graph is the graph Gini coefficient. The Gini coefficient measures inequalities um, uh, in any particular country. You don't need to particularly understand how it does it, but this is a generally well-recognized and established form of uh, measuring inequalities in different countries. The further you are towards the top of the graph, the more unequal the country. So if, the, if you went up to 100, one person would have all the wealth, no one else would have any wealth. And if you went down to zero, everyone would have equal wealth. Right? And here you can see trends in inequality uh, from 1979, which is kind of the birth of political neoliberalism, to 2015, which is the most recent year of data. You see South Africa notoriously has the highest, this is the highest in the world. Right, so the rating is 60%, which suggests that um, most, people, uh, most of the wealth is contained by very, very few people at the very top. Um, and then Brazil, you'll see, uh, was around the same level and then has declined. Around here was the uh, left government in Brazil, but also this was the start of the, the if you know, the BRIC period, Brazil, Russia, India, China, in which resources from those countries were used to generate wealth for them. You can see a de decrease in inequality, which might explain then the turn to the right, because that's clearly unacceptable to people who hold a lot of power. Right? Um, the more common thing is to have inequalities in these kinds of ratios. So China, you'll see, um, for a form of communist countries, doing very well on the inequality scale, better than most Western European countries. Here's Britain. Um, you'll see a decline in inequality until about 2008. Uh, I mean, it's, it, it's quite difficult because the scales, the, the, this is 10%. If you, if you open these up a little bit more, you can see quite, quite rapid movements in these uh, lines, right? 
But you see there's a kind of, as for most countries, there's a decline in inequality. And then from 2008, with the financial crash, there's an increase, there's an uptick in inequalities. It's quite interesting. Right? So basically the financial crisis meant that uh, because, of, because of the recovery mechanisms put in place, meant that people with assets, capitalists, uh, got most of the benefits of the mechanisms, of those recovery mechanisms, because it was a credit crisis, um, which of course means that most of the wealth in the country went to the people who already had wealth, which means increasing inequalities. Right? So that's, that's a kind of general structure. It kind of looks flat, but you'll see that there's a general, um, general kind of sense in which, I'm not quite sure where that starts just here, uh, general sense in which for some of the richer countries, uh, there's a kind of decline in inequality, as I said, an uptick. Um, but as with which country is this? This is Canada. Uh, yeah, even the Canadians had increasing inequality. Even the Canadians, that's how bad things are. Um, so this is income, this is another measure of inequality. Income shared by the richest 10%. So how the top 10%, one tenth of the population, how much wealth of a country do they have? Again, South Africa at the very top. These countries, uh, South Africa and Brazil, I think, mainly because the extractive resource industry, uh, industries are the main economic actors. Um, and that's been historical configuration since colonialism. So this is kind of inherited colonial wealth, which kind of describes those, those levels of um, segmentation of wealth. Um, so you've got these, a few countries over here, mainly in South America, and former colonies, uh, where you have these very high levels of uh, uh, a very high share of national wealth held by the top 10%. Um, and then you'll see there's a general kind of schmutter down here um, at around 25 to 30%. So top 10%, the richest 10% of the country own, for these countries, about a third of the wealth, right? which again is another measure of inequality. And again, this is kind of where things are globally. If you want more, if you want more, you go to the Our World in Data website, and they'll uh, you can type in whichever country you're interested in, and see what what the um, inequality chart is there. Uh, this is another way of breaking out this graph here. Um, this graph shows you how much. Sorry about the fuzziness; it's blown up from a very small graph in a piece of in a report from Credit Suisse. So again, if you want more of this, Credit Suisse Global Wealth. Uh, report from 2018, very good source of information. Um, so this, this graph here, if you look at the top 10% uh, uh, since 2000%, how much wealth they hold, you'll see, for example, in Japan, because it's the closest to me, the top 10% own around 48% of wealth. Okay? United Kingdom, again, you'll see from 2007 to 2016, about 10 years since the financial crash, top 10% went from owning 50% of the wealth uh, to just about 55% uh, of the wealth, increase of 10%. And it continues to go up, right? Oh, sorry, that's Italy. Oops, sorry. Uh, yeah, the Brits beat the Italians 52 to about 60, that's eight, uh, leap of 8%. Uh, America, <laughs> famously, the top 10% own 72% of the wealth in 2007, crept up to 76%. Um, Brazil, Russia, excellent if you're Russian. Globally, globally, um, the top 10% whole held about 87% of the wealth in 2007, and then it's kind of crept down a little bit to about 80%, which is still quite a lot. Um, so that's the, that's the top 10%. Um, now here are some graphs which kind of show global wealth in another way. This is uh, wealth distribution uh, according to global population, all right? So if you're in this blue bit here, this is 63.9% of the world's population, I think. Is that right? Yeah, global wealth pyramid. Um, yeah, so it's about 3 billion people, 3.2 billion people. Um, so 64% of the world's population have about $6.2 trillion between them, 2% of the global wealth. Uh, you creep up a little bit, so, uh, so that's less than $10,000, sorry, they, own, they have less than $10,000. These people over here, middle classes, between ten to 100000 uh, these are people who have up to about a million, and then these people over here have more than a million dollars, right? So people who, have, who earn or have less than, um, I think it's have rather than earn, 
people who have <coughs> less than $10,000 in total own 2% of the global wealth. People who have more than a million have about 45% of global wealth. Right? That's inequality. Uh, you can break out, you think that's bad. <laughs> if you look at this top bit over here, this triangle, that triangle is this one, this one is that one blown off, right? So you look at the people above a million, and if you look at those numbers, you'll see like uh, there's 37 million people with up to $5 million, uh, and another 3.2 million people with up to $10 million. So that combined combination of about 40 million people are what Peter Thiel calls single-digit millionaires. And he feels sad for them because he's a billionaire. <laughs> this isn't the case against Hulk Hogan. If you remember the Hulk Hogan case against, was it, um, which, against which one? Gorka. Gorka, that's right. Hulk Hogan sued Gorka for uh, accused, I you don't have to talk about it, it's fine. Um, so Peter Thiel helped him out because Gorka accused, um, ran a story about Peter Thiel being gay, which he didn't like very much, so he sued their asses uh, and closed them down. Um, so at that point, he was helping out Hulk Hogan at charity because Hulk Hogan is only uh, a single-digit millionaire. Right. Um, anyway, so he's, Hulk Hogan is in here somewhere. I wish I'd had a picture of him when I made the graph. Um, but if you look at this, people with more than $50 million, there's 150,000 of them-ish, um, there's something quite striking about the graphs. Let me, so these are what these numbers here are. The, the kind of um, multiplier of income, of wealth, from here to here is about 100. Uh, but the portion of, for each one person in here, there are 80 people down here. So these are kind of ways of assessing relative weights, if you want, of inequality. If you look at this very top, top bit up here with the millionaires, um, the distance from here to here is 10, right, from 5 million to more than 50 million. But for each one of these people, there's 247 of them down here, which suggests that the concentration of people above 50 million is much smaller than the concentration of millions <laughs> of millionaires against the general population, right? So, there's, there's a huge amount of wealth concentrated in very, very few people. That's what global inequality now looks like. So let's look at that top 1%. And this is how much they own in global wealth. I'm going to go at this pace throughout. So um, we're slide 14 of 101. We're over 10% of the way there. It's fine. So this is how much um, the top 1% own uh, of each country's uh, wealth. Um, and you see again, Japan, this is actually compared to the top 10%. So the top 10%, uh, give me a country, China. Okay, good, thank you. Um, so China, 57, 57% uh, is owned by the top 10%, goes up to about 62%. And uh, here, the top 1% own 28, 29%. It goes up to 30%, all right? So it's about half. Uh, Germany, kind of similar, actually. And again, Russia, if you're in the top 1% of Russia, that's very nice indeed. You've done very well, okay? And if you remember, so here in the UK, for example, the top 1% own about half of what the top 10% own. So even within the top 10%, there's a very kind of sharp separation between the very, very top, the one-tenth of 10%, 1%, and the rest of the 10%, from 2 to, two to 10%. And they've pulled away very markedly from everyone else. Right, so that's an that's a economic description of inequalities per country and globally. Uh, and this means this is essentially what the uh, effect or the, um, the driver of neoliberalism is. So let's think about what its politics might be. Um, there's a way in which, uh, especially in the art field, we tend to think about neoliberalism as sad things to do with money since about 1982. Uh, these are the words of Tiedad Zolgada, the curator. Um, it's a little bit more than that. What neoliberalism really means is capital concentration by dominant owners of capital, okay, which is what this previous graph showed. The, people, the, the dominant owners, not just the owners, not all capitalists, but the dominant owners of capital, people who have most capital, have concentrated wealth and income towards themselves. Right? That's... that's what increasing inequality means. Um, and that's really the core of what ne the neoliberal project is. Not that it's an intended project, but it's a kind of very useful mechanism for increasing wealth concentration. To do that, you need to reduce state control, because state control, for example, taxes 
means redistribution. And you can stop the concentration of wealth by law and regulation. So to uh, get rid of that problem, to overcome that obstacle, you kind of do an anti-government and anti-state campaigns, which is a small state argument. Um, it's also that um, investments, um, uh, how to put it, um, instead of accumulating through production, factories or services, which is to do with labor, you accumulate through finance. Right? So finance is money making money off money. It doesn't need production. It doesn't need people selling things apart from financial products. Um, people don't need to work outside of the finance industries. What it means is that if, you're, if you own wealth and you're making money through uh, financial mechanisms rather than production, you don't have to pay lots of workers. You don't have to pay for factories. You don't have to pay for land, and you don't have to pay those kinds of taxes to the state, which means you keep more money for yourself. And also the people who you make money from, which are sort of people in finance markets, take up much less of your total wealth than uh, workers. But the effect of that, again, is to make sure that wealth stays within people who can financially invest rather than gets distributed out. So arguments around trickle-down economics, which was a kind of political, motiva uh, political slogan around neoliberalism in the 80s with Reagan and others, um, it's, it, it's not, that's not what's going on. Uh, I think it happened again with the, with the Trump tax cuts as well. It was kind of sold as a trickle-down measure. Um, and then the final thing uh, that neoliberalism means politically is autonomization of social formation from politics to markets, which is essentially that we should surrender, uh, we should not bother with politics, um, and markets should be released from political limitations, but also that markets and economic kind of measures, uh, economic mechanisms, become ways in which people should organize between themselves. <laughs> right? So markets become not just uh, economic entities, they also become socio-political entities. Uh, and you can see this has happened through, uh, to use a very local example, it's happened through education in this country in a very forced way over the last 10 years. The move was to take education from a state sector provision, higher education, from a state sector provision and turn it into a market sector provision. And the current struggles that are going on in education uh, in this country are essentially do with marketization. As you see from this, marketization isn't just about turning things into markets, it's about neoliberalizing neo uh, fundamental provision. Okay, so it's happened with welfare, it's happening with education at all levels, uh, it's happening with health, it's, it's across the board. Basic social provisions become market entities, and that leads to this kind of uh, uh, organization through market forces, but of course that means deregulation and that means increasing inequalities. Uh, we know all this through the political slogan of the 1%. Right? So neoliberalism as a politics means one percentification or one percentization. <laughs> and actually, as we saw, because even with those, with those wealth triangles, it, we saw that the, the wealth is super concentrated in the, in the 1%. But if you, if you look much closer at that, it's actually the 0.1% or the 0.01% who holds most of that wealth. Right? So it's a bit like um, concentric circles. From the outside, it looks like the top 10% have most of the wealth, but within that, the 1% have most of that wealth, and within that, the 1% have most of that wealth, and so on and so on and so forth. Right? Um, so neoliberalization means 1%ification, but if fewer and fewer people have more and more wealth, so there's uh, statistics from Oxfam every year to the effect of 46 people in the world have more than the bottom 5 billion people, more wealth than the bottom 5 million people in terms of um, purchasing power. Um, if few and few people have more and more, more of the wealth, that means a highly polarized stratification of capital, but also a highly polarized stratification of power. Okay? And I'll do the power capital equation in a minute. What happens is you end up with uh, many people with very little wealth, very few people with very much wealth, and the bottom drops out. Okay? And that's the politics of neoliberalism. It's a pro elite politics. And what it leads to is a super dense Pluto core. Okay? The plutocrats form the core of the economy, and it's super, super dense. Right? It's yet to become uh, a supernova. It's yet to blow up. Uh, uh, it's more likely to become a black hole, which everything gets sucked in. So that's, that's the big picture. Uh, it doesn't get much bigger than that. 
Um, so now let's go and look at uh, inequality in art. Now, art has a long history of dealing with inequality through things like this. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about the commercial market in which this stuff circulates and does quite well. Um, so I'm going to base this on the Art Market Report from art ba USB Art Basel, uh, written by Claire McAndrew. It came out in 20, yeah, early 2018, um, or like sp uh, spring, summer 2018. Um, and, and Claire McAndrew analyzes uh, from responses, uh, she analyzes responses from gallerists um, around uh, mainly, I think around the world, but mainly in Western Europe and the United States, um, and produce some graphs and does some analysis. And this, I'll, I'll do a quick run through of this, right? So here is a description of sales in the global art market from 2007 to 2017. So things are going along quite nicely, about 66, million, oh, 66 billion dollars, right, global art market. This is all art, not just contemporary art, so steady on. Right. $66 billion. Oh dear, 2008 crash, drops down to 40. Everyone's in crisis, but it's okay. It's climbed back up, and it's now around $63.7 billion about a year ago. Right. So that's the state of the market. Um, this, is, um, this is growth in sales, uh, and this measures how things are changing on the market. So it's basically, if you took a line through this, um, that would be the zero point here. And you'll see that it's kind of a bit up and down around 2008. There's the drop. Um, and then it kind of picks up again. and Everyone's happy in the art world, uh, or at least in the art market. Um, and then it kind of starts just bipping around this point here, which suggests that the market's kind of capped out. It's not really going anywhere. Like, there's no dramatic increases or decreases in market value, uh, in, in total sales, rather. <coughs> so you could say pretty confidently that uh, art globally will, has stuck around $63 billion per year in terms of um, sales. Um, and if we look, think about how much that is, oh, OK, I've got the wrong number on the next slide. Um, so this is turnover per year for various companies. Fiat Chrysler, 130 billion. Uh, Microsoft, 90 billion. KFC, 23 billion. Bertelsmann is about 1.4 billion. That's a German media group. Um, uh, first did show the slide in Germany. Th this should be 63, not 55, as we just saw in the last graph. Um, and if you look at, say, Sony Pictures, that's about 10 billion, all right? So as, uh, the difference being that these are all single entity corporations. So one corporation earns 90 billion. KFC as a corporation earns 23 billion. This is the art sector, all of art globally, in sales, 23, 63 billion. Uh, it means, if you take as a proxy for like um, global economic significance, art is about halfway between KFC and Microsoft which kind of sounds right to me. So, you know, when you go, uh, when you go out, when you go from uh, doing your work on your PC and you pick up KFC on the way to the opening, it's kind of, you're in this 90, 95 billion. Right? Um, so that's, that's the overall amount. Uh, it looks, 55 billion looks like a lot. It's a lot of pocket money. Um, but as I said, these are single entity corporations. This is the whole of the art sector. So the real comparison would be cars or food or media, right? And obviously the numbers are much bigger. So art's actually still relatively small as an economic sector compared to other. But it, you know, 55 billion is not, it's not a small amount of money. It's more than the GDP of many countries. Uh, this is how it breaks down in terms of uh, the markets. You see the US dominates with 42% of the global market in 2017. Uh, China is second at 21%. UK, 20% still representing. Uh, and then some, some Euro trash over here. And, uh, <laughs> just, just to keep you awake, I don't mean it, that's fine. It's just, uh, and the rest of the world over here at 6%, right? Um, so basically the rest of the world is kind of France. Um, <laughs> And surprisingly, Germany has a very small market globally, given the intensity of the uh, art structures there and also the galleries that are there. But I think it might be because lots of galleries now based in Berlin uh, report to the US. Right, that's kind of where the drive might be. But that's, that's quite an interesting figure for me. So the UK does quite well in global art market. So well done for being here. Um, 
But all of that 50, 63 billion is not, is not <coughs> contemporary art. Contemporary art, uh, these are average sales by sector. So uh, how much, what is the average sale in millions in contemporary art? It was, uh, in 2016, it was about four. And about 2017, it's about the same. We do much better than antiques and decorative. Kind of starting to creep up on modern art. And then there's all the other fine art stuff over here, which we don't talk about. Um, so contemporary um, was kind of down here. It's now creeping up to modern. And we'll probably overtake it quite soon. Okay? So the art market is kind of quite strong. The force is strong with this one. Um, so you know, the contemporary art field is a serious part of the art game uh, in terms of market. But this kind of hides um, a kind of more specific uh, dynamic that's going on in the art field, which worries the writer of the report, Claire McAndrew. Right? And this is kind of what we'll get towards inequality. So that's kind of the overall size of the market. Um, then Claire McAndrew <laughs> says this. She says, so she now starts looking at, uh, if you look at different sectors of the art market, what's happening to sales in those different sectors. And she says this, some of the poorest growth in sales year on year, so if you remember that graph uh, with the zigzag line, uh, which was how the market is changing year on year, um, and it's capping around 63, you break that out into different, um, different parts of the market, uh, and you realize kind of what she thinks are worrying trends. Uh, she says some of the poorest growth in sales year on year was for dealers with turnovers under $1 million, which sounds like a lot, uh, and is a lot. Those dealers with sales below $500,000 saw a decline on average of 4%, which uh, are these people over here. Um, and dealers at the lowest end with sales around below 250 k faring slightly worse with 5% decline. Okay? So this is kind of the, the space where of emergent artists, <coughs> usually showing in relatively small spaces, Small, very small to small. Um, and this is the sector of the market which is showing a decline in sales. Okay? The poorer end of the market showing a decline in sales. The high end of the market, 1 million, 50 million, over 50 million, healthy, healthy, healthy. Okay? Especially if you consider that, say, inflation is, say, around 2% uh, on a good day. Um, so the actual drop is sort of minus 7 from inflation rate. You need to be about two just to be breaking even okay, in terms of growth. Um, so what we see here, the worrying thing is that the bottom end of the market, I mean bottom from a million right, in terms of your turnover, the bottom end of the market um, is doing worse, doing relatively badly, and the very lowest end is doing the worst of all. What that means, uh, uh, here's, some, here's some text, so it's a little bit of relief from lines and graphs. Uh, Claire McAndrew says this, one of the most concerning outcomes of the top-heavy nature of the market, I, most of it, uh, and the bit that's doing well is at the top end, a million plus, um, in a practical sense is the strain on its infrastructure from increased pressure on the middle market as values, to the mo as values move to the high end. So basically, um, this bit here, this bit is the middle market, and it's shrinking. Now, if you remember one of the effects of, of uh, neoliberalism, was the middle breaking, okay? And it looks like something similar is happening here. We have to think about consumption patterns in the art world, which lead to this kind of dynamic. Um, and it seems to me the two are very heavily connected through the figure of, this, of the collector, okay? Because the collector now is somebody with huge amounts of money, and what they're interested in collecting is supposedly high quality stuff, which is up here. Right? So the middle, starts breaking, but also the bottom starts eroding very fast as well. And this is only one year, so we have to kind of see how this develops. But mccandrew has been studying this for quite some time, and she's definitely very concerned about the direction uh, in which the market is going. Um, so just to continue with the quote from her, uh, while there continues to be considerable dynamism and vitality at the lower priced and more experimental end of the market, which is what, um, we provide here. The generally agreed most difficult areas remain the middle market where well-established dealers main business over 10 years. And mature markets such as New York and London are closing their premises, moving or going to private dealing. So people like Andrea Rosen, uh, Anthony Reynolds, all that bunch. <coughs> At the same time, the very top end galleries, bolstered by the success of selling works by the most sought after, 
highest priced, uh, highest priced artists are increasingly encroaching on the middle market by actively taking on more mid-level artists, cherry-picking them from mid-level galleries and using the super normal profits from superstar artists to subsidize any slack in their markets until they're adequately launched and promoted. So basically, the middle, the artists who do well in the middle get stuffed up and put into the top and everyone else can go do whatever they want. There's a kind of degradation of anybody who's not supporting the high end. Um, the effect of this is this uh, really unfortunate line. Um, so this is openings and closures and net gallery growth as a share of total galleries, right? So net openings are, uh, as a portion of total galleries, like 5% opening in 2007, 2008, 5%, there's a drop, 2009, because financial stuff, but still 3% uh, uh, of galleries uh, out of the total number are opening. Oh, no, sorry, hold on. Uh, yeah, this is the openings line down here. Yeah. Okay, so that's net opening. Sorry, I take it back. So the, the black line is what is the, are the openings. So 3% 3 here in 2009 um, of total galleries. Uh, there's a, there's a kind of growth in the number of galleries of 3%. Um, and then, so as you can see, it's kind of starts diminishing quite sharply from about 2010, right? Um, and where we are now is that there's a minus 1%, right? So it's actually uh, galleries. <coughs> oh, sorry, that, that number refers to the total. Okay, so this is the, this is the openings line. Um, this is the closings line you'll see that the closing line um, kind of increases up to about 2009, and then it starts dropping until 2000. And so yeah, more galleries close with the crash, then sort of they keep going, it's not so bad, then it kind of increases. And then since about 2013, a bit later than the openings line, <coughs> it starts dropping. What you see is happening is that there's more galleries closing than opening. So the first time, very recently, there's actually fewer galleries than there were uh, before, than there were the year before. Right? This is a new phenomenon, the art world. There's a shrinkage in numbers of sellers in the art system. Right? It's yet to be understood why, I think. But it's a source of concern. So McAndrew says, the ratio of gallery openings to closures in 2007 was 5 to 1, declining rapidly, dropping to 0.9 to one in 2017. So openings to closures, zero point, for every closure, there's now 0 0.9 openings of galleries. Right? There's less galleries opening than there are closing. Right? It's a new configuration. And what the economics of that means is that the galleries that exist, uh, uh, kind of, uh, so that the market gets strengthened around those. But again, there's an internal dynamic to that that yet needs to be understood. Um, okay, I'm just going to move on from that side. All right, so the overall consequence of, of McAndrew's analysis is this. The analysis of sales in both the dealer and auction sectors in 2017 provided empirical evidence of polarization, confirming the top-heavy nature of the trade, with the ultra-high end, the ultra-high end dominating values, despite the fact that most of the transactions and the majority of artists whose work come onto the market are at the middle and lower end. So even if the majority of activity in terms of artistic production and sort of manifestation is happening at the middle to lower end of the market, the ultra high end dominate, well, this sounds a lot like economic neoliberalism generally. In the auction sector, something similar happens, which is the middle paragraph, last paragraph. While the highest price, auctions are quite important in the analysis, not because auctions are important, but it's a one point of public price signaling. Right? So uh, as, as you may already know, uh, in the primary market, which is the gallery circuit, uh, people don't really know what prices are because there's lots of deals being cut, they're not advertised, there's lots of backroom activity going on. The only point in which the art world has visible price, uh, price signals is through the auctions, which is also why they're a really important point of manipulation by galleries. Right? So a lot of the kind of uh, stuff that you sort of see in newspaper, uh, newspapers and uh, news outlets, when the art market kind of appears in a, in a kind of shocking and exciting way, on the news, it's usually to do with auction prices and sort of things suddenly being extremely expensive. It's only because the gallerist has bought the work that they put up for sale to send out a signal about the importance of that artist. Right. This is for 
uh, contemporary art, anyway. Um, uh, so while the highest price works have always dominated to some extent in the auctions, which is also to say in, in a kind of uh, uh, common sense of what the art economy is, uh, in the sense that everyone knows something, the gap between this segment at the very top and everything else is expanding. Even at the top of the market in 2007, values were considerably less skewed than they were in 2017, and the middle market had less a share. So in 10 years, since about the crash, the middle is collapsing. Right? <coughs> and here, uh, again, to reinforce the point, in this highly competitive market, a very small number of artists. So start thinking about the triangle again, like the wealth triangle. There's a kind of similar, similar uh, structure to art markets now. Uh, a very small number of artists and the dealers and auction houses with access to their works continue to drive this, the bulk of sales values while others struggle to survive. The superstar phenomena is per pervasive in the art market. This behavior reduces risk. So why, why does this happen uh, in terms of uh, the interests of the collector or the buyer? It reduces risk by relying on established preferences of previous high-profile buyers. So you know you're getting something that will be resold if you're buying something off at, the high, at the high end. If you're buying something at the low end, you have no idea what the future sale is going to be. It might tank. It might go to zero. Half-life of the artist, which we'll speak about later, might be very short indeed. So your, your investments aren't very good. If you want to make a good investment, you buy something that's got rela reliable returns, right? which means stable, solid value, which means superstars. Uh, works by the most famous artists are in the highest demand and achieved by far the highest prices. On the whole, however, art businesses, and especially the smaller ones, which might be most of your first destination, find it more difficult to sell a wider range of works. Uh, let's just read the second paragraph. This is the final moment about art economy. The problem is twofold. First, that the closures are often small, and mid-sized galleries in the primary market, including those with highly professional and hard-working teams that form a critical part of the market's infrastructure. So can curators be concerned? Because most of the work happens in the small to medium-sized, you know, first jobs and so on, happen in small to medium-sized galleries, and they're folding. Okay? So it's not just sales of artworks and what happens to artists, it's also the infrastructure and the employment that takes place in this sector, um, which is disappearing. <coughs> Uh, and the other thing they do, which matters enormously to programs such as the ones we run here, is that it's the small and medium-sized spaces that often discover and raise key artists of a given generation and produce a range of positive externalities for other businesses, artists, and consumers. They kind of they feed into other sectors, essentially. Second, there's been a notable slowdown of new gallery openings over the past decade, as we've seen, indicating how potential issues could arise in the future regarding the discovery of new talent and both the introduction and cultivation of a more diverse range of buyers. There's a narrowing, okay? A narrowing and a shrinking of who, who takes part in, who buys, and what gets uh, circulated as art. Uh, these are the next effects of the art economy of the past 10 years. Broken middle, pro-elite, and this is the conclusion. Right. So that's, that's the kind of convergence or if you want the duplication of uh, general neoliberal political economy with the kind of uh, dynamics of the art market, and especially the contemporary art market in, recent, in the past decade, in recent years. Let's see what's happening with reputation. I said it was not going to be a barrel of laughs, um, but now, now it gets really dismal. Okay, for this, it's quite hard to talk about reputation in, uh, in sort of meaningful ways uh, across the sector. Okay, we kind of know about, so you know, when you talk about superstar artists and the rest of it, kind of pick out individuals and see individual trajectories, but it's, it's quite hard to get uh, a sense of what's happening across the whole sector. But luckily for us, in November last year, uh, these people wrote this paper for science. These are kind of people who, who look at network theory and do network analysis, uh, quantifying reputation and success in art. And I think they were interested in it from network, network science angle, 
because the art field is sort of loose and baggy, deregulated, yet it clearly forms a network. So it's actually a very good object for understanding what happens within networks without regulation and without uh, kind of strong uh, pre predetermined, uh, what's the word I'm after, kind of um, the strong, uh, without regulated channels. Okay? So it's a kind of semi spontaneous organization. Um, <coughs> Uh, oh, here, and then they say uh, in, the, in the blurb, in areas of human activity um, where performance is difficult to quantify in an objective fashion, so there are no criteria or benchmarks available. That's what makes them quite interesting as networks to study, anyway. Reputation and networks of influence play a key role. This is, that's the key term. Reputation and networks of influence play a key role in determining access to resources and rewards. To understand the role of these factors, they did this. this. They looked at a data set with loads of exhibitions, about half a million, um, uh, in these many galleries, about 300,000 exhibitions in this many museums, that many auctions, that many countries, most of the planet, over the kind of the period of the incredible success of contemporary art, and this many artists, about half a million artists. right? So it's pretty comprehensive. Um, as far as I know, it's the largest, largest um, scale analysis of what's happening in the art market. And uh, what interests me particularly about it is that it covers the contemporary art period. Right? From a, the contemporary art is like mid-60s, but really starts dominating the commercial sector from, well, actually, so it's dominating the commercial sector from about 2000. Um, but certainly it's kind of making inroads into the gallery circuit, certainly from um, the mid-70s, and by 1980s, it's ready to go. Um, so it's a really big database. Okay? So we're f pretty confident about the results they get. Um, this is some methodology. They define what they call a co-exhibition network, which are the, the, the it's this diagram here. Right. So each of these dots is a gallery space, an exhibition space. So there's one in Tirana over here, uh, others. Um, the bigger the dot, the higher the rank, which is to say the influence and reputation, right? So MoMA, Guggenheim, Gergosian, uh, so on and so forth. You see, like, there's actually not that many big dots. MoMA, actually, interestingly, is quite large. Um, I can't read what that says. Uh, Reina Sophia. Oh, yeah. Uh, Antwerp over here. Uh, you can try and find the gallerist interested in you somewhere, maybe over there. <laughs> or, uh, Singapore. Anyway, okay, let's move on. So, um, so this is the network. I mean, this, is, this, this drawing is the one that they produce after the analysis. So basically, you just start off with lots of different nodes, which are the museums and, and, uh, museums and galleries. And then you kind of see what the networks are, what the attachments are, in terms of which artists show where, and what prices those artists have in the market. And then you see how the network forms. And then you end up with one that looks like this. This is one depiction. There are others. And so the size of the, the, ra the ranking is a result of all that interconnectivity and status and values given to the interconnectivity and so on. Right? Um, so what are, the, what are the results from this? And again, I'll go through. Um, some of the results, essentially. Um, oh, yeah, I mean, there's one thing to notice is the colors, right? So the United States is red, dominates, as we saw with the, um, the pie chart of where the largest market is. Uh, uh, Europe is this kind of bluish color. UK is still included because uh, it's, no, it's a historical diagram. So this is kind of Europe over here. This is kind of America, and this is kind of... Uh, Asia Pacific Rim over here. Okay. So what are the conclusions of this? The network core was a dense community of major European and North American institutions, reflecting the pie chart as we saw where the market is, uh, underlying their access to a common pool of artistic talents. Movements between the hubs and the core was exceptionally high, which is to say that once you're in that middle clump, you stay in that middle clump, right? You stay in the kind of the core of the network. Museum of MoMA and Guggenheim, third, uh, sorry, the link weight, which is to say like how much traffic there is between MoMA and Guggenheim, was 33 times higher than expected if artists moved randomly between institutions. Right. 
reflecting a highly concentrated movement of selected artists between a few prominent, the same old faces, the ones that show the tape. Um, there's a prestige nexus. That's my term, not theirs. They say, for each institution, we computed the maximum relative price taken across all the artworks exhibited, observing a high correlation between network-based ranks and economic value of the exhibited art artist artworks. Essentially, the, 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 more, the, more your price, the more your work is priced, uh, the better institution you show in, duh. Right. And the other way around, which is, of course, why there's a strong interest by galleries to have their work shown in the highest uh, high, most prestigious institutions because that ramps the price up. And that's why most galleries support their artist FNs and not the, not the national organizations that curate them. So, uh, and also that's why um, uh, most museums show uh, artists with very high-end galleries because the galleries pay for the exhibitions, not the museums. Um, the top 10 ranked institutions have the highest cumulative sales values, <laughs> indicating that the co-exhibition network, though its construction is agnostic to price, it shouldn't really matter according to artistic merit, who shows where. Despite that, identified institutions um, have access, sort of the, the, the high-end institutions have access to highly valued artists. There's regional clumping. Multiple dense regional communities of institutions in Europe, Asia, South America, and Australia were relatively isolated from the core, indicating that members of those communities share artists mainly among themselves. That's, if you see that, there's no particular reason in advance why uh, all the yellow stuff should be separated out so clearly from the red stuff, and the blue stuff over, blue green stuff over here should be separated out from all the others, right? So that clumping <coughs> indicates that stuff that happens here kind of stays here, more or less. Stuff that happens here kind of stays here. There's a bit of migration, you see some red over there, a bit of blue over here. But this is essentially the core of the art world. This is stuff that we talk about because we haven't decolonized well enough yet. But decolonization, you'll notice, doesn't mean just that we talk about stuff in the rest of the world over here. We also don't talk about stuff that's happening um, all over the place, like in the Americas, as well as in Europe, as well as in uh, the Pacific Rim, or Africa, or South America. We talk about this stuff over here, generally. Um, so, uh, th th there's a kind of partial, I think a partial contradiction between what I've just said and, and this, this result from the analysis. An institution's geographic distance to one of the top 10 largest hubs showed no relationship with prestige, right? So despite what I've just said about the artists circulating between themselves, um, it's nonetheless the case that if you're doing very well in Brazil, <coughs> you will get a show in Paris. Erika Vesuti is just showing up at Pompidou former graduate of this program, at last, in the Pompidou. One of us in the Pompidou, yes, we did it. Um, I'm sure there have been others as well, it's just that she's doing it right now, so. Um, so the prestige circuit is quite tightly, quite tightly organized, and geography doesn't really matter, as we know, because of EasyJet and Ryanair. We jet around to kind of show in different places. Um, the network-based distance, okay, so, so um, the differences um, between, um, let me try to explain network-based distance, okay? Uh, you'll see here that um, the National Gallery of Victoria, which I think is in Australia, uh, is quite close to like the, the, the major clump, right, the central power over here. Um, that's network distance. It's kind of to do with the proximity of prestige or reputation, and that's different to geographical distances, because Australia is quite far away from MoMA, but they're quite close to one another in terms of who shows where and which actors are involved in which place, right? So uh, network-based distance of an institution to one of the top 10 institutions was closely linked to its prestige, of course. All the top, ex of top all the kind of high-end, high well-known Institutions show the same stuff. Liam Gillick. Uh, network effects play a defining role in influencing the evolution of an artist's reputation and valuation. Well, that's quite intriguing. Let's find out what that means. So, artist careers and prestige network. To show that artistic careers can be interpreted, interpreted within the context of institutions. So, 
that graph and those results we just talked about, what's happening with institutions, let's now understand what's happening with artists within that kind of clumping and network format. Um, so what they've done is grouped artists by the average prestige of the first five exhibits. High initial reputation is if the work of the artist was on average exhibited in the top 20% of institutions as defined by network ranking. Okay? So basically the larger the, 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 larger the, the dot, the higher the rank. You take the top 20% of those dots, like the largest 20% largest of dots, um, and you call this um, uh, high initial, high reputation. All right? You take the bottom 40%, and those are uh, low initial reputation. Okay? And then you see what happens to artists who initially show in that top 20%, and what happens to artists that show in the bottom 40%. Let's see what happens. It's not good news. It's not good news if you're in the bottom 40%. It's great news if you're in the top 20%. There's something that I would call prestige immobility. So uh, again, the, the, they select about 32,000 artists born between 1950 and 1990. Those of you born after 90 are going few. Um, it doesn't matter. It's like it's just that's a statistical thing rather than yeah. Um, and they had to have at least 10 exhibitions, and then you can start doing some tracking. As a group, high initial reputation artists had continuous access to high prestige institutions throughout their career. If you start at the top, you stay at the top. Of the 4,058 high-end initial artists, 56.8%, that clump there, kind of stayed showing um, in that high prestige territory until the end of their recorded career. And only 0.2%, one fifth of one percent start in the high end and then end up at the sort of low end. Right? So it's a very, very small number of people in the high end kind of start, don't, don't continue in the high end. Or in, that's kind of middle ish, I guess, over there. The lock in effect, as they call it, we could call it uh, artistic social immobility artistic economic immobility, the lock-in effect was largely absent for low initial reputation artists. Their reception improved with time, advancing slowly to institutions of increasing prestige. And of course, this is the career path of you start showing off in small spaces with your mates, and then you kind of middle-sized gallery is supposed to come along, pick you up, and then you kind of get transferred up the food chain, apart from we've seen that the middle-sized galleries are now collapsing. Right? But, so, but historically, that's been the path. So what we see is that 10% of artists who are initially in the low, low end prestige, low prestige institutions, 10% kind of creep up to the top end. Right? And these are the great success stories. So somebody like Lord Provost would be that. <coughs> Only 10.2% of low initial reputation artists had the average prestige of their five most recent exhibitions in the top 20%. So it's not great, but it's something. Again, 10% seems to be a significant figure. Um, but let's, so that's what happens to, to them in terms of institutional showing. Let's see what happens in terms of prices. So they collected, again, about just under, uh, just about half a million, under half a million prices of networks displayed in galleries, finding that the average maximum price of high initial reputation artists was just under 200K, compared to 40K for initial low reputation artists. Uh, sorry, low initial reputation artists. Um, and what we notice is that that 40K is 20% of the high end price. Okay. Which means that if you kind of start there, you're going to kind of stay earning 20% of people. Uh, so there's a real incentive to do really well in the art market. Right? Really, really, really well. Um, because the rewards, if you go up, are uh, massively greater than the rewards. If you, I mean, we kind of know this. Intuitively, but as far as I know, it's the first time it's actually been um, uh, uh, scientifically demonstrated and given specific figures. Um, so art careers are characterized by what they call the strong path dependence. Artists starting, in, so artists starting in high prestige institutions located at the center of the network showed a lower dropout rate intended to maintain their status. By contrast, those starting at the periphery of the network showed a high dropout rate, but if they persisted, their access to top institutions gradually improved. Which is great, 
but again, it's 10% who get there. So this is the, this is the uh, strong path dependence. Um, and this is a kind of diagram of it. So again, quite hard to make sense of initially. This is the reputation. And you remember, uh, if you were in the kind of bottom 40%, this is a low initial reputation. 0.8 is like if you're in the top 20%, high initial reputation. This is the maximum gallery price. And you see that if you start here, your gallery price kind of caps out around here. Um, and as you, as, as you go up in terms of reputational, you got a price that rockets up. This, this gray line is a kind of standard deviation. And basically what it means is that um, there's a very narrow, okay, start here. There's a very narrow, if, if you think of like a, a curve that does, okay, does that make sense to you as a, as a, as a line in the air? Right. If you think of a curve that does that, <laughs> the, the width of the curve is quite narrow for low standard deviation, it's quite wide for high standard deviation, which means that if you're in a low standard deviation thing, you kind of stay there, right? If you're in a wider curve, there's lots of room to kind of move around, which also means that you start going towards the tails much. Uh, there's more space to go around the tails. So basically, uh, people at the lower end, um, uh, there's a lot of mobility available to them. Uh, and people at the higher end, there's less mobility. But actually, if you're at the higher end, that's what you want. You don't want much mobility because mobility, you want to stay there if you're interested in income. Okay? So again, kind of common sense, but graphed with huge numbers of data, huge amounts of data. This is the interesting one in terms of uh, personal, uh, personal narratives. Um, a decade, for, for all of those reasons, a decade after their fifth exhibit, after their fifth exhibit, 39% of high initial reputation artists continue to exhibit. So here we are, if you go up there, that's about there. But you'll see that after 20 years, about 20%. This is of the high end, high reputation artists. If you're in the low initial institution, low initial, low initial reputation or prestige uh, uh, sector, after 10 years, 14% uh, remained active, okay? After 20 years, it's almost zero. Which means, if you want to make it in the art world, you've got to basically start like this. Oops. Patient going into a performance, I try to just let it happen. Just get me to the moment and you know, whatever happens, happens. <laughs> You all know this, right? No. That's, um, you all know it? Does anybody not know it? No. No, you all know it. Okay, so let's show it. I try not to have any expectations going into a performance. I try to just let it happen. Just get into the moment and, you know, whatever happens, happens. That's, that's how you make it. <laughs> Start at the top, and you'll stay there. I think Jay-Z's only problem is he didn't carry on making any stuff, but Marina's fallen out with it, and whatever. The, the, the basic instructions, sorry about the volume, when Jay-Z asked to turn it up, I actually couldn't turn it up any further. I don't know, don't know what happened. I let him down. Um, the basic uh, lesson of that analysis is visibility is centralized, reputation, centralized, extremely concentrated. Um, entrenched stratification, once you're in the top, you stay at the top. If you start on the low initial reputation places, it's 10% it's, it's that sort of creep up to the top side, but that's a long struggle. Um, and that, because the art world is built out of visibility, which is also to say reputation, and it's also to do with, it's also constructed out of institutional 
institutional hierarchies. I think it's almost exclusively those two things in terms of its practical politics, not its discursive politics. What we teach here is discursive politics, not practical politics, right? But in regards to its practical politics, what we end up with is power concentration. Right? Our world power is essentially visibility and uh, economic, economic value, price. Um, combine those two things in a highly concentrated way, such as we have in contemporary art, you end up with power con concentrations. What we could say is that art's reputational economy is elite reinforcement. Um, and then what I want to do with, from that conclusion, which, um, as I said, um, duplicates or reproduces exactly the, the, the tendency of <coughs> neoliberal economics more generally, I want to start looking at artist economics, artist economies, um, in terms of what is actually going on for most artists. All right? This will be the last section, um, and, then, and, then, um, and then there'll be some discussion. All right, this is the really dismal bit of the talk. <laughs> Uh, I, mean, I, I, I say it, I actually don't mean it as a joke at all, but I do want to warn you that it's, it's really quite grim. All right, so the, the report, again, uh, came out, uh, I think, just about a month ago or something. This is looking at data from 2015, all right? Um, so it takes about three years to produce this. Uh, it's called The Livelihoods of Visual Artists. You can get it online. They, they looked at about 2,000 responses of artists in England. So the previous discussion has been a kind of um, the discussion of the gallery circuit from Claire McAndrew. It's kind of Euro-American, Euro North American um, mainly, but there's some kind of global actors in there. The science, the, the, the piece about reputation was a kind of global survey. This is specifically about UK, uh, the UK situation. Um, what is the general uh, income of an artist in the UK in 20, in London, sorry, in London, in England in 2015. Income from art practice constitutes a small proportion of artists' total income. The mean average income, I, if you kind of gather all of them and divide by the number, for artists is 16,150 pounds, of which only 6,020 comes from art practice. Right? That's the average. But it's actually not appropriate to take averages uh, in situations where you have uh, lots of people at one particular end, either the high end or the low end, you're better off taking off the, the median income, which is the halfway point between the highest and the lowest, right? Um, because then you, you, you see much more what's happening, in this case, at the lower end. The median income for artists in the, England in 2015 um, is 12,500 pounds, of which only 2,000 comes from an art practice. Now, some of you are thinking like, oh, 2,000, that's quite good. Um, now the median is used the analysis is just that art income represents just 16% of total income it's not really that much of a surprise because we know it's quite hard to sell uh, when you're an emerging and new artist um, we'll see the difference between um, the mean income and the median income is 27% I put these figures up the London living wage is about um, 18,500 oh wait a minute I've got the figures here yeah, the London living wage uh, is yeah eighteen thousand five hundred, right? So both the mean income, which is the the, the the more inflated figure, the which kind of misrepresents the true situation, is already below the London living wage, which is how much money you need to earn to kind of be able to carry on relatively <coughs> okay, not well, but okay enough in London. And the figure set up by the Joseph Rantree Trust, which is kind of anti-poverty, uh, anti-poverty. Uh, policy group, they say what they call the minimum income standard, they say is 17,100. Uh, if you look at the, um, the median, oh sorry, yeah, so the 27% refers to um, the percentage difference between the minimum income standard, which is a kind of recommended, you go below this, you're in poverty, and the median income for artists. Okay. Artists are poor. Total income, so that's, that's the, that's the um, uh, overall figures. Total income is this. Um, 
So this is, um, so uh, yeah, sorry. Total income refers to like the accumulated, the accumulated amount. We'll look at artistic income later on, all right? So total income, see what's happening there. Gender gap, 25%. Uh, disability gap, 32%. Um, uh, if you're on the postgraduate, you're doing relatively well. Because you, you, um, you earn about 2,000 pounds more than somebody without a degree. Yeah, you wanted the disability? Yeah. That one? All right. Can I move on? Okay, I'm going to move on. Um, and by age, so if you look at total income, again, this is like art income and, and all other income as well. Um, from uh, in the 20 years, assuming you carry on, right? In the 20 years from being 19, <laughs> Oh, sorry, in the 30 years from being 19 to being 49, on average, your income increases 7K. Right? So for 30 years of work and struggling, you got a 7K increase. I, I wasn't sure whether to show this stuff. Uh, it was kind of very, very anxious and difficult weekend in terms of should I do this or not. But I thought we kind of know some of this intuitively and there's a kind of sense of what's going on. Um, but again, now we have figures. And I thought, we should talk about this. Because the question is, what do we do about this? Right? It's not to, in any means, uh, condone or endorse it at all. All right, let's have a look at what happens in terms of artistic career. Uh, if you're currently a student, your, your earnings, your total earnings are about uh, 10.5K, about 11, say 11K. Uh, if you're an established artist, the total earnings are about 20k, and again, remember that um, the national, the national uh, median salary, Hold on. yeah, the national median salary is 27. So even if you're a mid-career artist, you're still earning about 7k less than the median average salary in, in, in England, right? But in the uh, in going from being currently a student to being a mid-career artist, you earn 12k a year more in total and your total earnings will be about 18K. All right, so that's the overall income. Let's look at art income. How much do you get from the art field? Mean annual income from art practice is 6,020 pounds. Median income from art practice is just 2,000. We saw that. This is how it breaks down, all right? So 36% of artists earn less than 1,000. Uh, over two-thirds of visual artists earn just £5,000 or less annually from their art. It's up to here. 2% earn more than 50 k right? which is the kind of the super-concentrated elite. What you notice is that 64% um, of artists in England earn less than £5,000 a year from their art. 11% earn more than 15000 which, again, it's not a huge amount of money but it's, say, th oh, it's three times more than this amount. Right? That 11% again looks like it's very close to 10%. So again, you've got a kind of 10% wealth capture. Majority, two thirds in this case, are definitely struggling right? in terms of art income. Minimum income, oh sorry, yeah, and these are the lines for, uh, okay, so here. Uh, in terms of earnings from art, um, currently a student, uh, you're earning about a K, 1,000. Uh, Mid-career, you're earning about 6,500. Established, you're earning about 12, all right? Um, I did a rough calculation taking about 400 pounds a month as studio costs. Um, so studio costs are here. You kind of break even just on studio costs as a mid-career artist. You don't have very much more money left after that. Again. Um, this is artistic income, right? So it's whether the artwork is self, self-financing. And studio costs are like, the, if you have studio, it's kind of minimum basis for that. Uh, but again, look at the minimum income standard, which is up here, 17,000. And then the median income, uh, no, I won't do median, because it's a different, it's a different calculation, all right? So um, from one to about 13, that's, that's 12,000 in terms of artistic income. 
going from currently to mid-career. And of course, mid-career can takes about 10 years or something like this, but it can happen in lots of, it's not age-related. Um, let's look at age. Mean income from artistic, uh, artistic art practice. Um, again, uh, if you're up to 30, you, 2K is the average of mean, sorry. Uh, and if you're 40 to 49, uh, it's about seven and a half, difference of about five and a half K. Okay. Um, this, is, this is quite an interesting graph. And it's worth looking at the report to see this. Um, if you do participation, you do really well. Who would have thought it? <laughs> but it's true. Reason being, because if you do participation, you're obviously kind of um, uh, commissioned by various institutions, right? So there's income. If you're doing standalone practice in your studio, and then you've got to kind of move it to someone, um, you, you're in a kind of more of a commodity market. It's not clear what the income is going to be. So you can find your own type of practice. Right. So ceramics actually do really well out of all this. So I recommend. <laughs> it's a final debris show. Have a look. Have a look at the report. This, this, uh, it's, it's quite. It's quite intriguing. It's not too late. It's still got like six months before we degree show. So. All right. Uh, again, gender gap in mean income from art practices, twenty-one percent. I think it's a bit less than overall income. Disability gap, forty-three percent. Enormous. Uh, are our practices enough? Are our practices incomes enough to live on? Well, no. <laughs> um, if if uh, if you include, so this is about nearly all the respondents, about forty short, um, 30, 30 short. Uh, if you add these together, you're up to about 82 percent, not enough to live on. Um, oh yeah, three percent think it's lovely. <laughs> Not only did the majority of classes state that they could not earn enough from their practice, spend as much time on their art as they would like, almost 90% of artists felt they could not earn enough from their art practice alone to live. Again, not a surprising result, but um, quite interesting to have it verified and, and, and given some scale, right? Big, being able to measure it. What we see um, looking at this report is general income poverty for artists across the board, apart from 4% uh, maybe at the top. Um, and what that general income poverty does is reproduce, in fact, in probably worse ways than across the general population, standard hierarchies within income poverty. What's quite interesting, so basically those gender, those gender gaps and disability gaps reproduce the same thing elsewhere uh, in more general terms, but I think, <coughs> I haven't seen the other figures, but I think they're slightly worse. What's quite interesting about the report was uh, BME artists um, aren't significantly worse off in the art field, but they're significantly worse off elsewhere. Right? So that's why there's not, there's not any uh, graphs that when, they did the, when they did the numbers on it. It's sort of seemed that BME artists, uh, although there's, there's, I can't remember the exact number, there is a uh, greater dropout rate for BME artists um, than, than for white artists in England. Uh, but in terms of incomes, it's, BME are pretty much where uh, white artists are. So I think this general income poverty and also the, the relative um, imbalances in, in within that poverty can lead us to uh, something that I would call artist poverty, right? which is serious. And it's a real hindrance, of course, not just to making art, but to the rest of one's life, because it's poverty. Uh, well, why do it? Uh, they asked that question, and they had these responses, our survey said, um, artistic fulfillment was the main reason people did it. 48% uh, said it was the main reason they wanted to carry on being artists, artistic fulfillment. And if you looked at the top three responses, 70% of people had artistic fulfillment in their top three responses, right? So you can go down the list. I've highlighted the blue ones because I think this is the stuff that we push at Goldsmiths. Um, so we don't, certainly don't say that you're going to be financially well remunerated, partly because of talks like this. We might suggesting otherwise. Um, but also, only 7% of people only do it for the money. 38%, it's in the top three. Raising awareness of specific issues. God's friends. 5% uh, people do it for that reason. And then, here's another 1%. Uh, 
uh, gaining critical feedback from peers. Oh dear. <laughs> Let's just call it engaging with other artists, 5%. Okay. But the main reason people carry on and stay in this condition is because of gratification to be had from making art. Um, I think we, we, we also insist on these two things as something more than personal gratification because we think uh, you kind of still have that modernism built into the Goldsmith's DNA, if you want. Uh, factors important in developing and continuing an art practice. Um, I'll just put this up. Basically, oh, support and encouragement from a teacher. Oh, dear. Um, uh, finding a market niche. My general education. Right. Recognition by peers. Oh, my talent. <laughs> 34%. That'll get you through. Belief in your talent will get you through. <laughs> um, all right. So what, what, where does all this take us? That, that, was, that was the kind of, that was the harshest, harshest moment in a way. Um, and I think it's actually really, really very bad situation. Um, but we have to, I think, take it seriously in a way we don't often talk about on this kind of program. Um, Let's, let's kind of tie together the different, the different parts of the, of the talk. Um, so you remember that in terms of gallery revenues, the stuff at the top kind of is taking all the wealth. So there's a market super concentration, right? Um, there's also a high-end concentration in terms of reputation and prestige, which is that sort of blobby map thing that we saw. Um, and there's also high path dependency, which you remember means that if you start in the top end of the, of the sector, you stay in the top end. If you start from the bottom end of the sector, you kind of are more likely to stay in the bottom end, but there's some chance you'll kind of like go, go up. I think all of that, which as I said, kind of, I think accurately or well enough adequately um, gives, gives the sense of the total configuration of the global art scene. I think all of this means power concentration, right? Which is uh, the, the structures in the art world are set for elite success and only elite success. It doesn't give a crap about anything else, really. Okay? That's global art structures. Let's take that power concentration, um, which is, sort of summarizes all of this. And then let's multiply, let's think about artists, general artists' poverty within that power concentration. If you're very, this is, I think, the situation most artists uh, face when they, when they start their careers. If you're an artist, you don't have very much money. Not only do you not have very much money because your income is very much lower than most other people's who are working, you also have added costs because of your art practice. I think one of the reasons, it's not mentioned in the report, but one of the reasons why artists have low costs uh, sort of low cost, low incomes, is in order to kind of maintain some time to continue with their art practice, which commits you to uh, part-time jobs, commits you to jobs that don't sort of rise up the management structures, which become more and more sort of demanding, and uh, require you to kind of give up more of your existential, uh, existential sense of self to your job rather than your art practice. So there's a kind of uh, self, uh, uh, kind of commitment to the art practice um, sort of keeps the income level quite low. Um, you have not very much money. There's extreme power concentration in the art field. You, we are extremely highly dependent on power concentration. Okay. That's that's the net effect of uh, the art economy. Not just the art economy in terms of its large structure, but also artists' incomes or artists' poverty. And what that dependence on power concentration means, if you look at it from the side of the elite moment in the art field, is that they take all the gains. That's how, this is a kind of um, Gregory Shalet dark matter argument. They take all the gains of the art structure, of the art field, the activity, the busyness, the new practices emerging, so on and so forth, and they extract from it, but give nothing back. Okay? It's an uphill extraction. So it's the opposite of trickle down, it's trickle up. That's what the art field is, it's trickle up, and there's very little trickle down, which is why there's quite a lot of artist poverty, 
with very few people who are successful, but the people who are successful have all the visibility. Which again is kind of intuitively obvious, but now there's a kind of structure and a logic for thinking it through. Which means also we can intervene in that logic. The poorest 90% in this economy benefit the richest 10%, the richest 1%, with very little social mobility. Okay? The poor support the rich. Which means that arts political economy is neoliberal all the way through, from the top to the bottom. So that's, that's the conclusion. But uh, one more thing. <laughs> what can we do about this? What is, what is to be done? The famous question. What are the options available to us? So, I mean, again, that's, that's quite, a, I think, quite fairly thorough. It could be thorough, thorough-er. Uh, that's not really a word. It could be thorough-er. Uh, in terms of the analysis. There's a fairly <laughs> thorough analysis of uh, what, what is going on in our field. Um, and I don't, don't think it's enough just to leave it there. A response is needed, because I think this is a, a, a totally crap situation. Um, and it's, it's destructive. It's extremely destructive to most people who are entering into the art field, economically and existentially. Um, well, there are a number of options. One is to uh, kiss ass. Just, just do that stuff. Right. Hope you'll be either in the top 10% or you'll be in that 10% of the bottom 40% that kind of creep up. Plutocratic power. What and who creatives or artists appeal to, and I've not mentioned curators in this, but it's, curators are definitely within this economy uh, with different pressures, I think. What and who creatives appeal to and rely on for their own economies has to shift from a one-sided, extractive subservience to a neoliberal elite. Even if they don't talk about themselves as neoliberals, insofar as they perpetuate this economy, they construct a neoliberal economy in the art space. But what this requires in turn is a restructuring of arts economy and remuneration structures, and also the reorganization of the political economy of the art field and how its hierarchies are established. Now, this is a really big task, but of course it's not going to happen by one person or in one go. It takes many interventions over many periods of time to produce, to think about and produce other economies. And I think it's actually quite a good time to do this. Uh, just as contemporary art played an effective part in the hegemonization and domination of the neoliberal ordering, the success story in the contemporary art field, it seems to me that art, for exactly those reasons, and because of art's plasticity in relationship to its conditions, art can also can and should also play its part in the undoing <coughs> of that condition. And as I've said, what this means is restarting with the revector is starting again with the revectoring of art's economy from a dependence on the urban rich and super rich who are its currently economic centres. And it's a propitious time to do that because neoliberalism is currently in crisis. So we don't need to be locked into the same things we've been locked into for the past 30 years. And I'll stop there. Thank you. So it's fraction from the 1% back down, right? Mm -hmm. So the counter-economy seems that we have to build something from scratch. But I also think we have to present our bill uh, if it's not through income in other ways. So I wondered what you thought about things like, you know, that's been looted for many years but something we actually could get really serious about right now is a transaction tax on auction houses, mm -hmm. for example. Um, artists' campaigns for um, uh, guaranteed income, for example. Um, you know, all the work that Wage has been doing, so it's sort of a unionizing kind of model for you know, set rates for exhibitions, yeah. etc. So they're all small measures, except for the transaction tax, which I think could kickstart that. But don't we need to have an ask as well? Yeah, no, no. Yeah, yeah so I'm, just, I'm just wondering what you thought of it. Yeah, no, I, I think maybe if I, if, I, uh, if it sounds like I was saying we need a, a separate economy, okay. I'm not meaning that, because I think that's still too much in the refusal model. <laughs> so I think what's important is actually to change the economy as it is. And a clearly part of that must be to kind of stop this uphill extraction and to kind of reverse it, uh, but maybe also change the very organization of having such a steep, steep imbalance. So one of the one of the kind of Keynesian activity would be to turn 
uh, pack up the middle again, rebuild the middle. Um, so that, and the standard way to do that is taxation, of course, so some form of taxation. So some form of taxation, uh, I mean, this would be quite interesting in terms of larger logics. If you're going to tax a transaction, not just in the auction houses, but why not in the galleries as well, then you should start declaring prices in the gallery structures. That would be a really good move. Yeah, and then you could get into anti corruption, tax evasion, so on and so forth. So the art world is riddled full of people who are kind of pumping money into art because it's not regulated and it's very, very trans transnational as well. So it's a great place to store hot money, which is why the art phrase in Miami, drug money, right? And it's kind of quite deliberate, quite deliberate move, I think, to put it there. Um, uh, so I think, I think there's lots of activities and regulations that can be put in place. What we'd need to do, I mean, two comments on that. What we'd need to do is get over a phobia of regulation, because we're in the art world and art world is free, and anti-status, blah, blah, blah. There's got to be some kind of statism uh, kind of demanded from people in the art world. And I think it's important for people who don't do very well out of art to demand it. Um, so I think there's some kind of the payback demands, if you want, um, uh, so certainly need to be put in place, but they, they need um, organization and they need some kind of um, uh, campaigning as well, and they have to make sense. So I think that's where Wage is quite good. Uh, as, I mean, I'm, I'm on the board of Wage, so there's a little bit of self-promotion here. Um, but Wage, uh, if you don't know, it's working artists in the general, and the general economy, wageforwork.com, uh, and the campaign there, as Susan said, is to kind of set up uh, floors like benchmarks for what it is to put on exhibition. It's dedicated mainly to the, to the public uh, non-profit spaces, and it just says, like, if we're going to give you an exhibition, then pay us this amount of money, and it's calibrated against the annual operating budget <laughs> and so on. And that becomes a kind of standard across... It's being used internationally now. So there's a, there's a change of expectation that if you show work in a public space, a non-profit space, rather than do it for free because it helps your career and you'll get some reputation, which is the uphill extraction model, um, the expectation is you should get paid because you're doing work and they're benefiting from it. Um, there are further consequences in terms of the kind of economy. So I certainly think um, demands on the rich who benefit from art. Um, there has been, there's been an interest in resale, resale royalties in auction houses, but it seems to me that's, that's very, um, very mild demand, very small demand. The real pressure should be on the gallery structures Actually, and also the gallery structures, uh, according to this analysis, rather than just going to every gallery and saying, "We want a percent of, um, we want a percentage of the art to go to maybe a common fund that people who uh, can show that they are professional artists or have an artistic career." I mean, a bit like Germany does with health insurance. You can sort of, you can validate that you've got some exhibitions and the rest of it. You can claim health insurance. Uh, maybe it should be a part of sales that of the. You know, several, the 63, what was the number between KFC and 63 billion? Or maybe not that much, but like whatever billion number it is. Um, a, 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 some of that should go to an artist fund. I mean, it'd have to be regionally organized and the rest of it. So that's, that's one move. But I think the, the more fundamental move would be really that there's got to be a broader politics of um, this anti power concentration model. Um, and I think it's easier to do in the art field than it is uh, elsewhere. Because there's absolutely no necessity for the art field to be structured in the way it is. And also artists and curators and people in the art field, we're quite interested in how things change. That's what most of us are here for. Right? So there's a sense in which there's more consensus on the changeability of things. Um, but it means that artists and curators and people in the art have to get conversant with these kinds of institutional structures and not just pay attention to what you're doing in the work. The work itself. Um, unless, unless you're somebody like Cameron Rowland. Do people know Cameron Rowland's work? Um, so he's, a, he's a, a black American artist in New York. I think he's going to have a show at the ICA next year. Uh, and he, he puts quite a lot of effort into how the work circulates on the market. So he rents it out to collectors. Great model. He keeps ownership of it, but he rents it out. And he also has very, very long and serious conversations with his collectors about what it means to have it in their collection what they're going to do with it, and he keeps control over it. So the <laughs> exhibition history of the work, which is also his price, price history, 
uh, he kind of keeps some control of that by not giving in to the ownership structure that the gallery uh, you know, traditionally requires. So I think those kinds of moves can take place. If they become common, um, then it's going to be quite hard for gallerists to refuse it at all. And also, the advantage we have in the contemporary art space is that it's still, as we know from like the discourse attempts, uh, discourse attempts from the discourse that we uh, indoctrinate you guys with here, um, it's a moral space, or it claims to be a moral space, where we're interested in progressive, progressive tendencies, at least that's the claim. It's very hard for galleries to counter that, which actually gives a lot of power to people who make these kinds of claims. So Wage actually uh, meets a lot, for to take an example, Wage meets a lot of resistance from institutions actually signing up to Wage and becoming Wage, uh, wage certified institutions. But quite a lot of institutions use Wage as a kind of benchmarking. Um, because the moral cause is there, it's really obvious. So I think there's lots of things that artists can use, and I think it's much less, <coughs> it's actually much less hard if we turn to this, to do it in the art field than it is to do elsewhere. And I'm quite interested in using the art field as a test bed to kind of think of, of anti-neoliberal strategies and forms of organization. Because the economics are quite similar, but much more plastic. And you don't have to deal with uh, the law and other state actors and so on and so forth. So inroads can be made quite fast, I think, in the art field, but it's not gonna happen through putting your work up for some collector or some gallery to come and take them. If you do that, it's a first step to rethinking how a transaction then happens. Two, just two questions here and then one there. Oh, there's and then there's two at the back as well. But take the, can I take these two together? You, you go first and I'll take James's after. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, so I was thinking about uh, cognitive mapping into new art like what you provided us with, what the really cognitive map of a character totality that I would understand our own position within it, and that is the precondition to take any form of action. <coughs> but I was a bit dissatisfied with your conclusion. Uh, not with the four possible options and that the counter economy is the better option. That to me seems quite obvious. But um, oh. I guess the necessary task is to then also have a equally um, possible cognitive map of this counter economy, right? Because mm -hmm. if, if we can describe the current state of things so well that when it comes to an act of navigation and taking action, we have no cognitive map of the alternatives. You want me to tell to say what we should do next? No. Okay. Like how do we go? How do we provide it? Mapping? Yeah, it's how really. What exists, but how it could be? How do we actually visualize yeah. an alternative so that we can have yeah. a navigational? No, that's 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 exactly. I, I'll I'll just respond to this and then um, go up to the next question. I I think that's exactly the right question. Um, it was already quite a long talk. <laughs> it was partly a patience thing. Um, but I think that the issue is, and one, th this is kind of, um, this is actually a very rough sketch. I, mean, I think it's the first sketch, it's very large, it's very schematic, and it's, it's, just, it's just kind of an economics. It's, kind of, it's not even like a very good economics, it's, but it's a kind of basic picture of where we are. My sense is that this is kind of, uh, as you know, I said a few times in the talk, it's a, it's a kind of filling out some of the details of what we intuitively understand as you potter around the art space. Um, it's that kind of it's a kind of bereft feeling of going to Hauser and Wirth. It's just like, ugh, yeah, art, uh, but like, uh, kind of economic inequality kind of sticks, and I think this kind of lets us articulate it out a bit more. So there's a kind of um, yeah, maybe a cognitive map if you want, or a conceptual scheme that we can organise it. But it's only a first draft of one. I think the the reason I I, um, I don't want to kind of fill out more than fill out more than this at this point, because I think these are the broad directions, that the, the broad possibilities. There might be others as well. This is all I could think about between finishing and doing the talk. Um, but I think the counter economy, um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to construct. And I think um, it's something that, that I'm sound, gonna sound like a cop out, but I think it needs quite a lot of discussion to understand what the best move to make is. 
um, it needs to we need to understand where it's situated. It also depends on the kind of actor and power and wealth we have in the art field. It seems to me that uh, if you're in the top 20%, you can do different things than you can do if you're in the bottom 40%. Um, so I think, I think the kind of strategy, for me the strategy is clear, it's a kind of testbed for a counter neoliberalism. Uh, I'm not clear if that means socialism or communism, I think it could be something else altogether. Um, um, but the tactics of it seem, seem to me to be specific to what powers the actors have, what we can envisage collectively, because this a change to this won't happen by one or two people doing anything. It's going to take like a bunch of, actually I take that back a little bit, Wage, to use that as a, as a model, started off as three people coming out of the Bard MFA who kind of set up a, a demand, um, and then it's kind of modified a bit, but essentially it's still quite a small number of people. Uh, in fact, one person, Lisa Skolny, who does most of the work, but they've spent 10 years kind of doing that work and building up reputation. Um, so I think it's possible for very few people to do quite a lot, especially because you can use the amplification methods of social media. And if you like this kind of thing, shaming mechanisms, another way to put that is moral prerogative, um, to, to, to make effects. But partly, as with, I'm not, quite, I'm not gonna advocate the strike model, but as with the strike effect, you need quite a few people to make demands in a certain direction. So this, it's, it, it, it's gonna take quite a bit of time to understand what those demands would be, which ones are the best placed in order to achieve certain outcomes. Um, so for me, it's quite a nuanced discussion, uh, but it's money to do with the power that certain, acts, if you're just emerging from an MFA, you have different power to somebody who's showing up pace more than steam for 15 years. But those guys could do something too, you know. And it's partly it's partly a kind of baby boomer problem. That in a way, those people have done quite well out of the explosion of the art market, and they've pulled the ladder up behind them. But my problem is that we shouldn't be trying to be on that ladder because it's a ladder for elite, elite elitization. Um, so I don't have an answer to your question about how to do this, but I'm pretty clear that a counter economy. I take Susan's point. I think it's, it's the important one. It's not like an economy wholly independently of current structures. I think pressure's got to be put on the current structures. And it seems to me the, the, the best places to do that are social media, because it, it moves very quickly, um, and also um, public institutions, because they have this kind of double face between serving an artist community and serving a public, but also, as I was saying, they're extremely beholden to commercial galleries. So they're quite, they're quite vulnerable to um, <coughs> social and political demands in a way that galleries necessarily aren't. They can use those again as amplification and mediation mechanisms. So that's, that's the best I can do for now. We can have longer discussions about what to do next. Um, but I think it's, it's like that thing Oscar Wilde said about socialism. It'll take a lot of evenings to, to work it out. Maybe not that many. Yeah. Um, I, because art and art and, and for a while it has been uh, a luxury economy, an economy of high price products, um, it might be useful to make or buy a study that compares art to other luxury economies, say fashion, um, which has a lot of similar things going on in, in some ways, but the, the difference I guess is that it has a, also a, a broad base, say fashion for the public. Whereas art doesn't exactly have a, have a broad base of customers who want it. That seems to me like a problem <coughs> trying to make art a fair sector of the economy. Maybe that can only happen if there's a large class of people who want to buy art and who can buy it at a price that they can afford. Uh, so that might happen in book publishing, but it doesn't happen in art. Obviously, there are reasons for that. So I'd like to know whether we can make a counter economy without having a broad base of economic activity. Um, I, won't, I won't take up all the points. Um, there's, there's quite a lot of literature about um, prestige, per, prestige, per, <coughs> prestige purchasing. Uh, and it's certainly the case that at the top end, art is now a luxury good along with other things. 
Um, so you have a yacht, you have your football team, you have whatever subsidiary of House on Birth in your own country, but you, you have your museum, your museum, contemporary art space. Um, so I think, I think that's certainly there. Um, the thing around the broad base, I think there's an issue that is the, that we do have traction on, uh, which is that the Tate, I think, is one of the top five, if not the most uh, well-visited tourist destination in London. Um, and that's not uncommon for contemporary art spaces in different cities. They're extremely popular in terms of tourism. So there's certainly footfall to be had. Um, the question is how you take up that demand, popular demand, for contemporary art space and um, put pressure on the institutions. Again, so I don't quite know what that would mean in a way that would sort of change this economy at this point. It needs more thinking through. What I would say around the... Uh, and it was partly response to the previous two questions as well. So I think you're quite right to say about the broad base. So in a way, the issue is like, how do people? How, if you want to change the if you want to change the economy of the art field away from this model, you have to get rid of this kind of climbing up to the top and this kind of super this kind of Pluto core moment. One way to do that is actually an old-fashioned notion of art, which is like people buy at quite low prices, and that's fine. Just cap out at like two and a half k a piece. That's totally fine. Just sell more of it, but it also needs more buyers. Right? So uh, you know, in response to some conversations in previous talks, um, there's this claim that, which I don't, I don't quite buy, um, there's a claim that there's lots of, the only people who can be in the art field now as artists are people who are from quite wealthy families right, because of the cost of education and the rest of it. Well, actually, if you do come from a wealthy family, just instead of making art, buy art as well. And just buy art at low prices. <coughs> buy art of your friends, buy art of other people you don't know. Go around a circuit in which, like, there's a, uh, you know, people are selling at like 750 grand, 3,000, something like that, and maybe don't buy it for resale. That would change the art economy quite dramatically. More people would be able to live off their art, um, and uh, it would it would be another circuit than the circuit that. The thing I'm trying to get to at the end is is breaking the dependence on the super rich. Right? So you need other need other buyers. But also means that the kind of um, purchasing dynamic and what purchasing is for has to change. Um, so it seems to me that actually, if there's lots of people with wealth interested in art, as well as making it, buy it. That's one way to do it, and that would kind of um, that would produce more liquidity. Uh, not liquidity is the wrong term. It would produce more transactions at the at the bottom end, maybe the very bottom end. But great. Okay, and I, actually, I think because we hope that the, in, the really interesting stuff is happening like here <laughs> rather than at the very top end. Um, if, there's enough, if there's enough capital weight around uh, emerging artists, new artists, um, that will draw attention from the rest of the art field. And to come back to your, to your question about what does this country economy look like, the question is that when that attention arrives, what do, we, what do we do with it? The mistake would be to go like, thanks guys, I'm off to House and Worth, see ya. Come to my opening if I let you in. That, that's the mistake, because that's just the 1% plutocratic kind of model. Right? What would need to happen is like, when the attention rise, I think this is what Morgan was talking about in his talk as well. Like, there's something quite interesting about saying no to, to amplifying the costs. It's really hard because of the last third of the talk around how artists live. But again, it seems to me that that economy is partly an effect of very, 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 very little revenue uh, coming. coming oh, there's very little revenue washing through the art system. It's super concentrated. Right? That big money is not going to come and, and sort of check out and support stuff that's happening, um, happening with, with emerging artists. And when it does, like Zablodovich, people like, snap a hand off. I mean, not in a, not a BDS kind of not that kind of BDS, the other boycott, divestment, sanctions kind of way. Um, uh, so what am I saying? <laughs> Sorry, I just got distracted. I was like, uh, God. Um, Anita Zabladovich, BDS mask, BDS sanctions. OK, yeah, so when, when rich collectors do go to emerging artists, emerging artists are very enthusiastic because you want to get on the train. Right? And that's the promise it gives you. Not sure the promise always delivers. It's more likely to because there's a collector like that around. The logic itself is the problem. 
my interest would be, as with the boycott divestment sanctions, stuff around the Zabludovich collection, uh, what would be to boycott high-end gallerists and to agree to boycott it for a 10-year period? Everybody just refused to sell to high -end. I mean, this is an example of like, here's a strategy, let's think this out and see what the consequences are. Let's all agree to boycott high-end gallerists for 10 to 15 years and grow, grow an economy independently of them. That's quite an interesting proposal. It would be a very different economy than the one of the artist's poverty that I've, I've shown. It's not that there wouldn't be any poverty, but it would, it would be distributed differently, and I think there would probably be less poverty because you would inflate from below, and it would break the dependence on, this, on the super rich. And if the most interesting work of new generations is coming out in that sector, those guys are fucked. So that's, that's, that's one way to kind of use revenues in relationship to uh, moral demands in relationship to the content of practice. But it requires uh, one person doing it on their own, doesn't matter. It's going to require kind of a generational effort or like a significant number of people to join in. And even if you have 10 or 15, sorry, I'm kind of rambling on a bit because I'm now excited about the prospect. If you have 10 or 15 people doing this and saying it loudly, it would make a big change, I think, because other people go like, oh, actually, this is an option. And the politics of it would become really very pressing across the field, especially with social media amplification. There were two, two questions, I think, at the back. Aaron has, yeah. so this, when, can, can people who have questions just put your hand, oh, you've got the mic? Yeah. Okay, he's got the mic, sorry. <laughs> um, I just, uh, thanks for the talk. So, uh, two years ago, I read um, an article by Ben Davis, um, which was about in getting an MFA worth the price, and it kind of um, scatters institutions and like whether it kind of all your um, graphs, but how uh, MFA is ranked within that. Yeah. Um, so, firstly, would you consider putting the institution such as Goldsmiths within this presentation? And then, secondly, how do you think institutions um, play a role in that counter economy um, by Goldsmiths? You mean the you mean H R schools? You mean? When you, say, when you say institutions, you mean art schools? Yeah, art schools. Uh, yeah, art schools are a really important part of this impoverishment mechanism. Uh, and as, as you all know, the double bind is that you kind of need an MFA now to kind of be taken seriously in the art world. So like, it's a, it's a rite of passage in a way it didn't used to be. Uh, but that's kind of history that it didn't used to be. So it's, it's kind of a given that the MFA is a, is a kind of a prerequisite for visibility. Um, so, and of course, uh, the, the MFAs or the, the art schools should be on that on that clumpy map thing from from uh, the science the guys in Science Magazine. Uh, but they're not because they're not part of the pricing structure in the same way. It would be interesting and correct to put the price valuations of artists who emerge from MFAs on onto the map and sort of backtrack to see how important they are in terms of status and visibility. That, that's a really important thing to do. So they're certainly part of the power hierarchy, that's for sure. Um, uh, and they contribute at the same time to artists' impoverishment because they cost a lot. Um, so they're, they're totally integrated within this economy. Uh, and I didn't mention it here because I don't have the figures. Uh, and also, um, I don't think it's, I mean, it's pretty clear to me that, that we're, we're part of this mechanism here. And an MFA like Goldsmiths, because of the rep historical reputation, prestige, blah, 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 should matter more. And if you think like that, we're already in the logics that I was describing. Right? So it's really kind of Pluto core logic that if you come to Goldsmiths, it's worth more to you in some kind of intuitive way than going to other art schools. Um, I'd be interested to hear which other ones. But I Uh, 
Uh, no, that, I mean, that, that specific Royal College because that had large, that a large subsidy from the state as part of the royalness, which was supposed to run out. It's true. No, it's totally true. It's not, it sounds ridiculous, and it is ridiculous, but it's also true. Um, the, the, as, as, as this government, I don't want to get too much into it, but as this and I think the previous government um, uh, sort of decided to marketize higher education, they protected certain institutions, especially those with the word royal in it, um, from, from full marketization. Goldsmiths has the fees it has because we're already fully marketized. Um, so it's a major problem for the Royal College because it was so heavily dependent upon state subsidy in a way that other universities weren't. And certainly other art schools weren't. Whereas Goldsmiths has like zero, I, mean, I think very, very small. Uh, I think that's right, I'm not quite sure, actually, I should take that back. Um, so it, it's, uh, I don't want to get too much into what the Royal College is up to, no, mostly because I don't know. Just, 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 it, it is, but it's internal to higher education market. Um, and this question was more about the relationship between the MFA and the kind of larger economy and sort of plutocratic movement of plutocratic plutocentrism of the art world. Yeah, I think MFAs are totally part of it. Absolutely. Um, but I, how, how do you think the institution should... Should respond to it? Yeah, like, or is it part of that counter economy? Like, a student come to university because it's like a, it helps them, in any degree, it helps them get further there. Uh, okay, uh, I'll try and answer the question. None of this is necessarily anything Goldsmiths is going to do or the MFA fine art is going to do and so on. Um, it seems to me that it's, uh, I, think, I think we should do talks like this one. That's what I think we should do. I think we should talk much more seriously about the structures of the art system that people are entering and what it means for a practice. Not just for the practice in terms of how will you live as an artist, how do you get jobs. That's really difficult to construct on an international program because we can't speak to you know, what your tax situation is going to be in France or in Angola or in the United States. It's just, that's, it's just too complicated to do that uh, internationally. Um, but I do think, uh, how to put it? I don't really have a clear answer to, I, I don't really have an agenda in mind on what the MFA can do. But it seems to me that what we can, yeah, okay, let me say this. Again, it's a very general answer. What we can do is think about what a practice is and what happens to the possible Okay, so it, it, this, is, this is a discussion for what, I, what I've seen happen on MFA Fine Art. I don't know what happens on MFA <coughs> Curating because I'm very rarely invited to do anything on that program. <laughs> you should, I would do it. Um, but maybe this is why you don't want me there because it's just too, <laughs> too depressing. Um, but I think, I think when, when we talk about what is a practice and how do we engage with it, it's always about the content of the practice as though, which is kind of modernist model, right? So it's kind of exists in a vacuum. We don't think practically about uh, some of the responses that came up, some of my responses to the other thing, which is like, what kind of space should it go in? Who, who would be interested? What is your, not quite market, but your catchment? What kind of catchment do you want? Like, who would you want to see the work? How would you operationalize it? And I think the reasons we don't have that discussion is because we're still committed it's not just Goldsmiths, I think it's, I think Goldsmiths does it less than other places. But art school and art teaching is still, certainly in the UK, I think it's more mixed in the United States, I'm not sure, I can't speak about it elsewhere. I think in Germany as well, it's, it's more this autonomous model. Right? So we kind of think about how to engage with artwork and its criticality, right? and what it's meaning, how people respond to it and stuff, but its actual operation, how you could operationalize it, what it could do in terms of socioeconomic structures doesn't really enter the conversation unless somebody's doing work very explicitly about poverty or you know, other kind of social issues, in which case it's like, well, if you want to do that, just go and become a social worker. And it's just like, no, that's, no, no. It's a much more complicated conversation than that. But the same demand should be there for every art practice. So part, part of the response to your thing about how do we set up a counter economy would be, well, actually part of the discussion of an artwork in a crit should be how is it going to function economically? What do you want to do with this? I think that would be a great discussion. It would be a real-life discussion about what it is to be an artist as regards making a practice, and not just making a living off it, but using it as part of, but deploying it as part of the political economy. But we don't do that. So I don't think MFAs 
uh, people might know about other MFAs where this happens more. I don't think MFAs are quite up to the task of the counter economy yet. Sorry? Why I'm, what the fuck is this talk, man? <laughs> <laughs> Just like an hour and a half. What do you mean I'm not doing it? <laughs> my, my weekend ruined. <laughs> I'm not doing it. I'm not, okay, I mean, just, just to, um, actually, do you want to give the mic to, to Aaron, because he had his hand up a while ago. No, but I can hear it back. Oh, did you don't want it? <laughs> well, do you, do you, did you have another question, or was it? No, I mean, this is, I think, my, my basic question, but it's kind of the same that was asked before. I mean, I feel like every Monday we're told that it, something is not good, and we should do something about it. Um, is that before you come here, or? <laughs> <laughs> but then, um, like, through the module, model of education that's given to us here at Goldsmiths, there's no, it's like no alternative. We're basically groomed into a system which you criticize every Monday, <laughs> which isn't questioned in the program itself. And so um, I understand this is kind of um, discomforting for you, and you're trying to escape. But I think this is the real issue. Why isn't the MFA really proposing a counter model? Why aren't there models of solidarity or, or new economies developed on the program? Uh, because we teach to artists' interests mainly, that's why. We don't, well, teach, we don't teach doctrinally. No, I understand, but if even art education spaces have given up the role of trying to actually change the system, where would it come from? It's like we're hoping someone will somehow like you said, 15 people will somehow show up. But if arts, like education space, gave up that possibility, I think that's really sad. Yeah, um, I, I think the reason it doesn't happen uh, is structural within, this pro within our program. Um, but I think it's also, so it's basically we teach to people's <coughs> interests and da-da. There's a real uh, fear. So now goldsmiths, I mean, speaking um, in terms of not individuals, but in terms of program ideologies, there's a fear. This is a this is a, something said in in the mid '80s. Um, so the move was to get away from the kind of master system or the the connoisseurial art teacher arriving in and going like, ah, more yellow, and then walking and going like, okay, I don't know why, but like the master says more. So to get away from that, the emphasis <coughs> is switched around to the student as the one who's the generator, provides the you know, provides the basis of the discussion and also should lead the discussion. That's, that's the model we have here. It makes it very, you can't have doctrine in that case. The doctrine we have is individuated practices. So if you're asking for doctrine, I think my, my sense is like, yeah, we should do doctrine, but that's not, that's not the ideology of our programs. Right? So, um, the, and the second point around, okay, there's two more points around that. One, I think that that's, that's because we're very, very observant of the plurality and multiplicity of contemporary art. What we endorse above everything else is that contemporary art can be whatever it needs to be according to whoever wants to make it. So we always, response, we always respond rather than lead on it. That goes to much, my much larger complaint about contemporary art failing political projects for exactly that reason. Okay? So if anybody has a political project, it's about their practice and what the political project of their practice is rather than of the art field. What we end up with is a depoliticized art field whose politics is its economics, which is a neoliberal condition. But if you're committed to contemporary art, that's what you've got to go with. Right? So there's a, there's a kind of history in which we, as a program, and again, I think this is true of all of the major MFA programs, we kind of produce the contemporary art model. Um, and that means we can't, be, we can't indoctrinate. <coughs> uh, we can't produce doctrines. And if I say, do you want indoctrination, we'll be like, no. No, that's not what we're into art for. We're here against indoctrination. So, um, th and the second thing around uh, why we don't come up with solutions and stuff, I think is attached to the model of critique that we're still operating with, where the cr critical moment is to, um, <coughs> is to not provide solutions, but to throw up questions, present difficulties, show problems. Did I say problems already? So we have problems, uh, problems, no, problems, questions. What are the other things that we do? Problems, questions, what? Difficulties, Difficulties anxieties, support, all, all that stuff. 
we don't do solutions. And if you do propose a solution, it goes like, oh, you're being really dogmatic. <laughs> like, I'm not interested in dogmatic art. I want to have my open ideas about it. It's like, well, OK. So actually, so there's, a lot of, there's a lot of refusal of the kind of political prescriptions that are needed to address this condition. And the third, or maybe the fourth issue, <laughs> is that if you get too much reputation for having doctrine, it's a big dissuader for potential applicants who want people come to contemporary art to continue their practices and find the freedoms that they have in it. That's not to be discounted. It's quite important that art remains a space for individual freedoms to kind of uh, formulate themselves and find articulation through art practices. But I did do the talk. <laughs> and I do have some proposals. And I am on the board of way. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, give me a break. Um, in Spain, um, I, I've been for around three years in Barcelona before I came here. And in Spain, we have a political model which is called um, Buenas Prácticas. And Buenas Prácticas is a book that gets thrown around and kind of taken to institutions, um, public and private, in which there's a sort of barometer in terms of prices, you know, how much. Um, an artist should be getting for having a show, um, how much an open right. call should be giving an yeah. artist fee, you know, what percentage of right. the whole. Yeah. And in that, there's a lot of advocacy. We've had this for quite a few years in Spain, and I was quite surprised when I arrived in the UK and that, you know, this sort of manual, um, I don't know if it's out, I don't know if we have one in the UK. Um, uh, the people around artists' newsletter were trying to form an artist union. Sure. I don't I think, think it's yeah. not done very well, I think. But people use the wage schedule as a, as a proxy for that. Sure. But the reason why I'm coming and mentioning this is, is because of, it is forcing a lot of um, kind of institutions and open calls to really kind of have that allocated <coughs> artist yeah. fee, you know? That artist fee is becoming really, really almost like a, a survival um, threat for a lot of artists in Spain. Um, with that, there's been also a rise with the, of um, open calls. We have a lot more open calls than I see in the UK for artists, you know, like in the late 20s to the 30s. And um, that, I think, perhaps operates in some way as a counter economy. You know, artists are being, at times, being fed with this money, apart from making work and exhibiting and displaying, etc. But what I, what I think a counterpoint to this that I kind of realized and see in Spain has been there's a lot of art being made that has this kind of feel of open call, that takes all the open call boxes. And that's been spreading almost like, almost like a disease in Spain, I, I think, um, in which art is beginning to look open call. So that there's a certain loss of radicality in, in art operating um, as an answer to the barometer of the open call, you know. Um, so I, I, in one way I'm like, yeah, great, this counter economy perhaps is existing in some kind of way, it's staying in that form, but then it's also um, kind of creating a difficulty which is um, making art which is very specific and that kind of answers um, this arrest yeah. of the open call. Um, I, I kind of think that's okay. Actually, I mean, like you know, the 63 billion art, art market. It's it's there's just loads of different types of art in there. And only a small portion of it is contemporary art. There's lots of antiques. There's fine art stuff. Blah blah. blah. So like, there's lots of different. I, I don't. I'm not quite sure why um, why we should assume that all artists kind of do stuff that any one of us might be interested in. Uh, it's not true within contemporary art. I don't see why contemporary art should think it's got some priority or prerogative over others. So I think the economic issue has got to be somewhat um, differentiated from the artistic merits issue. Like all of this is just about economics. I guess, I guess the, 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 the um, um, I don't have a thought, I'm gonna just think it out in real time here. I guess the thing with that kind of clumpy map structure and the privilege, the prestige, the prestige map um, is, that, is that as the, um, how to put it? Um, that's, that's also a map of visibilities. Okay? It's a map of relative cultural power, and therefore what signifies and matters as art um, in the contemporary art field. 
Um, and to that extent, it's a kind of, it's a, it's a gravitational well. Like the bigger, the bigger your rank, the more you signify and it percolates out. So I guess my issue around the open core, my interest in it would be, well, actually, maybe it does let lots of artists have more of a living, higher income through their art practices, which means less time spent doing other jobs and so on. Huh? Um, and if it's not what you think is like good or interesting art, well, it's too bad for you. You know, it's kind of, it's it's like that's not really the issue around this. The issue is the eco so. Uh, I, th I think I think the, the, there was something around this in Holland around the time when I think just before austerity hit, because Holland used to have very high subsidies and good subsidies for artists, and there was a sense in which people were just turning out any old crap just to demonstrate to the state that they were artists so they could get all the benefits from it. Uh, and like people used to complain very bitterly that oh, lots of Dutch artists. Are, but you look, at the, you look at the visibility structures anyway within the art field, they're very, very narrow. So it's not the case that if you take all of that stuff away, remove the subsidies, make it harder for people to do open call art, that there's gonna be like amazingly good art that will suddenly become important. Like, there's lots of amazingly good art that becomes, um, uh, this, this, let me just finish this point. There's lots of amazingly good art made by many people on this program, historically, which doesn't become visible. I mean, it becomes visible within the sort of communities that we're in, but it doesn't get marketized that well. So I think, I think there's, for me, it's kind of important to differentiate the, uh, at least in the first iteration. Um, I, might, I might want to rethink it according to what economy we want and whether that can be geared towards certain claims. I'm not sure what those claims would be because I don't think there would be agreement about them. Um, but in the first instance, I think the current model doesn't, doesn't even with that, the markets, even without the subsidies or the state support, the current model doesn't, <coughs> doesn't have great art or interesting art or art we're really excited by become significant. I mean, so sometimes, but actually not very often, I think. Um, yeah, sorry, I forgot to add to this that the, the issue that I see with this is not so much good or bad art. It's not. The issue is not there for me. The issue is that um, a lot of people kind of then sort of abandon any kind of um, avenue into accessing, let's say, the real art economy. So they, there's a lot of people that then will not give a voice and will not be able to change in, let's say, the kind of the 10% or the 1% of okay. um, the art world, which was what you were mentioning before, that we also need to get voices in there to kind of address and make change. So sorry, I forgot to kind of add this. This is for me a little bit that kind of issue that's happening in Spain that through the kind of the turn to the open call, um, there's a sort of abandonment to the private sector, the commercial sector. Um, and then, so there's less voices of Spanish artists in the art market because of this issue. Yeah. Okay, I can't really speak to it. So I think that to, I, you know, it's depend on the contingencies of the, the program. Then any more, I'll take a couple more. Okay, this, uh, this three, okay, this one, two, any on this, oh, four. Okay, I'll take, I'll take two questions and then these two questions, so, Anthony. Can you, can you? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, you've spoken quite a bit about uh, visibility, uh, or relative visibility, I guess, of artists within the art world. Um, the one thing I think particularly if I look at, say, television or uh, media is the visibility of art. Um, it doesn't have that kind of visibility that there is for uh, other art forms, like, um, you know, the, the reality TV or um, that sort of thing. And the, the question would be then, is how does one get society to attach a higher value uh, to art? And I don't mean that specifically in a commercial sense, but even if one is arguing for uh, more tax revenue to be allocated to the arts, uh, one needs to get public physical aware of the importance of art um, um, and to ascribe a value to that. What are you asking? I'm just saying in terms of strategy, um, oh. is, is part of the strategy is that one of the levers is to raise public awareness of the importance uh, of art, whatever it might involve. 
Um, I, I don't think that's necessary for this argument. One of the issues is maybe that the art economy is too large. And, that, that, and, and so it's, its uneven distribution is part of the size of its funding. But, but you mentioned as an example uh, tax, taxation, but I mean, in order to get government to pass a law that uh, imposes such a tax, the budget would, would have to be behind it. That's not a scale issue, though. It's a question of lobbying and who, 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 the, um, who the beneficiaries are and also what the government is and what its interests are. So in New York State, there's been concerted efforts over, I think, 20 years. There's been one particular New York State senator who's been trying to introduce a resale royalty on art in New York State, and just like it keeps on flunking on the floor um, because just the interests aren't there, and the interests aren't there because in the elite circles in which these people operate, the galleries uh, are functioning. So I, I, I don't see that, I don't think you need, like, Mass and popular support for a change in the art field. But I think you do need more support. I don't think so. I think it, it, it's 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 a politics within within our field, <coughs> and, and it's this field is very very sensitive to reputation, extremely sensitive to reputation, and that's enough. I don't think you need large numbers. And my sense is that we have an overinflated art field. Um, Just um, touching on Alan's point before, in terms of um, the course not being prescriptive to certain to certain things and just kind of offering what the uh, students demand or, or want from the art. But I think, I mean, in terms of these Monday lectures, this comes up, or like uh, more of the claims comes up, and then, you know, they state the problem, but in terms of not offering like certain solutions, I don't think there should be a kind of prescriptive, like this is what you need to do, but. I think there could be modules that could operate in terms of functioning as a thinking of counter economies or opening up kind of think tanks or way that the work also functions in, in ways that operate differently within an economy that's just not does this look good or is this critical enough. So I think there could be a lot of things done within the course that could kind of really create these mm -hmm. these possibilities to, to kind of expand more on the models and I think I think everyone would benefit from it just from like your lecture in terms of numbers and you know, if if it, if, it, if the future is so grim then surely everyone would be invested in some rethinking like different notions of how to how to change these models and these economies. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I agree. Um, I, just a quick note: the future is not necessarily grim. The past and the current this current condition is yeah. quite grim, <laughs> very grim. Um, <coughs> no, I agree. But I also think the demand can come from yourselves. And you could also do it within, within I mean, I don't think it needs to be taken up by the tutors specifically. I, I think it should be a bit more. Um, we, we need to kind of have some sense of how to implement it and when to implement it in the program. Um, but I think it's perfectly fine for anyone in a crit to stand up, you know, stand up, and don't stand up, just carry on sitting down and say like, well, how would this operate in a, in a gallery space? And what would you want to do with it in terms of resale? in terms of sales. How would you control that? Do you want to control it? Anybody can say that. So that yeah, just saying in terms of like the models that are delivered, they are like prescriptive in certain issues that get thrown up, and I think there's other yes. you know, things yeah. that could be paying more emphasis on the course. Yeah. Which, I, you know, you could change. Um, have that kind of power. So, so, some, somewhat? Not entirely. Um, no, it, it, could, it, could, it could happen. Um, uh, the one thing that we'd have to take very seriously, and this would have to be a decision that when we've tried to do a little bit in the past, it gets a lot of uh, pushback from students, is that we then have to kind of think practically rather than critically about artworks. Right? So and that, that kind of changes the tenor of the program. Um, to, to, to me, there's an, the, the, like the deep, the deep issue that we'd have to contend with is whether we still want to keep some notion of autonomy around art. Right, yeah. And if you if and if you take this up, we abandon it. That's a really big step. And I for me it's fine. I'm kind of I think we need to. But it's it's there's a lot of ideological struggle in that. Um, I think it's interesting how, how art operates in terms of its criticality and also what it what it does. So I think it's an interesting question to raise in terms of artworks and how they function.
Uh, I'm, I'm kind of tiring quite badly, so I'm going to take these two questions, maybe take them together, and then um, Dennis, I think, down here. Wait, can we get the mic? I, I, I got interested when you demarked the beginning of neoliberalism, it's 1979. And uh, I was thinking what is the best of um, counterculture movement. And is, um, it, would, uh, it would be um, um, the effect that neoliberalism somehow reincorporated culture, culture, uh, counter-cultural um, ideologies within their um, um, uh, uh, repertoire of argumentation or um, discourse. Um, a problem today to um, start a counter-economy. Okay, and then... Uh, all right, and then I'll take this one as well. So no, you already did that. Oh, I've answered that one as well, so it's fine. I, I send you an email. It's Louis, but uh, it's fine. He doesn't. He doesn't want to ask it. Um, so uh, uh, I, my my angle on this is just a straightforward: Boltanski and Kiepolo, new spirit of capitalism, which is that '68, the kind of like you know, the, the, the the paragon of counterculture, just became yeah, as you said, the operating model for uh, what they call neo-managerialism in which all the standard claims around counterculture against standardization are now uh, not, just, not just well commodified, which is what we understand the commercial art world to be. Um, it's also the, the paradigm for how um, businesses think they need to, feel they need to operate in order to keep people on board. Right? So basically, counterculture, um, uh, yeah, you're right, becomes becomes the, um, the model for a legitimate form of business operation. Um, but I don't think that, that diminishes, I don't think counter economy is the same as counterculture. Counter economy is like, how do we organize another economy? You can just, you know, maybe as, as the question at the back was, that, that culture could be really conservative. Like, there's nothing about counter economies that suggests um, counter culture. Uh, and also I think the whole counterculture thing is very much attached to legacies of the avant-garde and they're done. They're, they're, we don't have an avant-garde anymore and I also don't think we should have an avant-garde so it's a kind of normative claim for me. Um, but I think counter economies are extremely important because they're about the distribution of incomes. I don't see any, any need for, it's partly the same response to the question above, um, I don't see any need for uh, cultural um, uh, cultural direction or cultural framework um, within that. I do think there's something about um, uh, the culture of elitization, elite cultures and things that legitimize them, which does depend on counterculture. So I think there's a cultural effect of the counter economy, but it wouldn't be a countercultural effect, if you see what I mean. It's actually a normative, it's actually a normative demand rather than an anti-normative demand. All right, thank you.